Well, now that the business of who's going to be the Speaker of the House is behind us, this week House Republicans have actually used their majority to start passing some bills. Now, who knows if Chuck Schumer will take it up in the Senate or if Joe Biden is going to sign it, but at least they're letting the American people know what a Republican majority stands for and what they're doing. So what's this all about? And what was that fight last week really accomplished? And what did it accomplish? Let's speak with one of the freshman members of Congress who was one of the holdouts, Josh Prockin, 2nd Congressional District in Oklahoma. Thank you, Congressman, for joining us. Hey, thank you, Larry. It's an honor. And, and it was about uh, getting to the people's business, uh, returning the House of Representatives back to a deliberative body. And, and that is historic precedent that has been all too often forgotten in the last 10 years as we've gone from 15 trillion national indebtedness to now 31 trillion. Yeah. People are so used to omnibus spending, they don't all, all too often remember there used to be something called appropriations bills, actually 12 of them. And there used to be a budget committee mm -hmm. that would set caps that could could uh, uh, bring about these appropriation bills to stay under those caps. That's right. I worked for out the name of Tom Coburn, who was in the uh, uh, House of Representatives in the seat that I now hold years ago, and as a part of the contract with America from 95 to 2000, and they had an open process. They had a deliberative process where any member could go to the floor and put amendments on a bill on bills, and that's what we were uh, advocating, and that's what we were able to obtain from from the from Speaker McCarthy as concessions to return us back to a more open, deliberative process that can uh, hopefully bring about uh, the tools that can can start cutting spending. That is so, fantastic. No, and, and the fact that you are sort of um, upholding the legacy of uh, Tom Coburn, a legend in this town when it came to budgetary restraint really is fantastic. And it is kind of, it's ironic that the mainstream media, and certainly the media in this town, you know how DC is already, you've only been here a couple of weeks, but you can sort of get the picture. The, the whole idea that who the Speaker of the House is and what the rules are with regard to how to pass legislation and what the agenda is going to be, the idea that that's not part of the business of the House is so disjointed. That's the first and most important primary part of the business of the House of Representatives, I would think, Congressman. Yeah, it is. Without, without a good process, without deliberation, I, I would I dare to say that ta all too often it's just been actors on, on a the theatrical stage. Mm -hmm. The reality is since 2016, not a single amendment derived from the floor has been allowed to be put on major pieces of legislation or any piece of legislation. Six years where you had nine members of the House of Representatives handpicked by the Speaker and the Rules Committee, and they, they have this super legislator status. And these super legislators... Um, are, are making the decisions about what amendments should be allowed on the floor. Yeah. And, and I have a problem with party-led governance. I'm a big believer in, in George Washington's commentary that factionalism is dangerous. And we need to be a country of, of principle, not how can I make sure um, you know, a particular uh, party stays in power. And I think that that is the issue. And it's why all too often we try to keep softballs on the floor so yeah. it doesn't put people on hard votes to protect majorities. We've got to turn this country around and we've got to put principle ahead of party to turn this nation around that's headed towards a fiscal cliff with our with our runaway federal spending. Well, and, and I want to get into some of your ideas and, and what hopefully the Republicans will be able to advance in that regard. But one last question looking backwards to last week, because you did, you had a lot of votes for alternatives to Kevin McCarthy as you were holding out through those, I think, 15, 16 ballots. What, what was the big concession? What was the, the thing that Kevin McCarthy agreed to that eventually led you to say, okay, I'm on board? So from, from 95 to 2000, in that contract with America, we love the politics, right? Everybody wants to use the politics of contract with America. From 95 to 2000, 50 to 58 percent of every bill that came to the floor came with an open rule, meaning any member of Congress on the floor could put an amendment on it. Mm -hmm. uh, was I holding out to, to get us closer to that historic precedent? Remember, that's the era again that balanced the budget in 2000. Yeah. So I was. What we obtained in this concession, the leverage that we applied was on every general appropriation bill, we can put a spending cut amendment on it. And we can go before the American people on the floor, house derived amendments that are gonna be uncomfortable, but we can be surgical and say, man, I like a lot of this, but I don't like some of it. And the sum of it is leading to uh, deficits that is, is, is moving us to, to a place that we're not gonna be able to return from. So and so I'm most excited about that. I am super excited about the leverage we applied that also that Morgan Griffith, before the three-day standoff, we have single subject, single yes. subject 
can't hide bad provisions of bills any longer. You can't camouflage these 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 egregious things inside of good legislation. And then on the amendments to make sure that whatever amendments get put on are germane. So just some simplicity, common sense. Well, things that that's, that's going to keep us from the spectacle of, you know, you need hurricane relief in Florida because people don't have any power and they're drowning and they can't get any food. So here's a hurri emergency hurricane relief bill. Oh, and by the way, it's also, you know, half of it is for some sort of wind farm in uh, rural Massachusetts or something, which you would never vote for. So that, that's all great stuff. Now, I'd love to talk about how how you're going to go about getting as much done as you can. You, you come from Oklahoma. You were a state senator there. Um, where it wasn't necessarily a divided government. Yeah, you've got a small majority now, plus you've got a Democrat-run Senate, plus you've got a Democrat in the executive branch. Realistically, what are you hoping to accomplish? So I'm hoping in, in two years that, that we change that, let me say that. That's why it was so important to get rules in place uh, now, because in, in the hopes that we have a Republican in the White House and a Republican-led uh, Senate, then with good rules, the ability to be deliberative the ability to do more than just vote yes or no. I mean, I don't know a single member of Congress who, who runs thinking that they're just going to have the ability to vote yes or no on the floor and not have the ability to, to change. Yeah. So this can pay dividends when we achieve that goal in two years. Well, Good rules can outlast any speaker. The average speaker of the House, you know, is 2.5 years. Yeah. Good rules that people get accustomed to can, can, can last many, many years. And so my hope is these rules, once people go, oh, wait a minute. I, I now understand the, the, uh, that a budget committee means something, that, yeah. that we have, have appropriation bills that live under the caps, that people will then continue the process, and then we become the Republican Party that adheres to the principles of true fiscal responsibility. And you know, the reality is we didn't get to one trillion in national indebtedness until 1980. Now we're at 31 trillion. We've doubled it in the last decade. We went from 15 trillion just a decade ago to now 31 trillion. Everybody has to gain, has to take responsibility for this. I would also argue, Congressman, if I may, that uh, by proposing a series of bills that just get stalled in the Democrat-run Senate, or even if they make it to the president's desk, they get vetoed. The Republican Party, through this majority in the House of Representatives, is telling the American people exactly what we stand for and what you could hope to accomplish should you win the White House and the Senate. In other words, you're making the case for flipping the Senate and flipping the White House Republican. Absolutely. They aren't these all great ideas. If you just give us the majority in the Senate and give us the White House, they'll become law. Yeah, but, so, yes, absolutely. It's espousing the ideals of, of conservatives. The the 87, the defending of the funding of 87,000 uh, IRS agents at a cost of 80 billion dollars. Yeah, that is something. When we get in negotiations, these 12 appropriation bills, we can build that into the budget. Perfect. We can example. start with a, a budget that says, "Wait a minute, we're zeroing that out." Yep, that's so, a perfect example. And and by the way, all 210 Democrats voted against uh, firing those new 87,000 IRS agents yesterday. They also did another thing that I'd love for you to comment on here in our final minute. Uh, the Republicans passed a, uh, a, a born alive bill. If a, if a baby survives an abortion procedure and is a living but clearly physically wounded living human being outside of a woman's womb, the bill that you passed would have provided medical attention to that little baby. Every single Democrat voted against it yesterday, and I'm sure Chuck Schumer won't even bring it up. I'd love for you to comment on that. I think it's crazy as a society we would have to have a bill to force a provider um, to make sure that they give a, a child in that situation life-saving treatment and to have and provide criminal penalties if they don't. I mean, th this just goes to, to show that we are a nation that has got to have a great awakening of our priorities, our culture. And, you know, politics is downstream of culture. And so my hope is that we become a righteous nation again that looks at life and values it. And that this wouldn't be something you would have to, by law, bring about. In the heart of man, it would come about naturally. Um, but yes, that is a, another example where we know in a 10-year period, you had 143 examples of this. Yep. Where a baby is born from 2003 to 2014. These are real examples. That's and we're saying if you as a provider, you must give them the same care you would any infant that was struggling to find life. Loving this freshman class. Welcome to Washington, Representative Josh Brockina of Oklahoma.